Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is the first video that I've actually posted that's anything of meaningful value. Um, I'm new to YouTube um, as a contributor, so uh, bear with me as I'm learning the ropes. I promise there will be mistakes. Um, as far as the reason you're here, I'm assuming that you're probably here for the Raspberry Pi rack that I posted to Reddit the other day. Um, I really look forward to seeing what you guys come up with on that. Uh, it's, it's been kind of a passion project of mine just trying to put something together that I would like to use to hold my cluster together. Uh, as I started to look around and see if there was anything out there to buy or to build, I couldn't find anything that I really liked. Um, so that, that brought me to the point where I am today, which is I learned how to design something. So one of the original requirements that I had for this was that I wanted to use it as a learning experience for myself. Um, so that when it came time to design other things, I would have that skill set and that, that ability. Um, a huge shout out to uh, CV4U2015, um, the first person to reach out to me to support the project. I think that's really cool. I appreciate that. Um, so how is this video series going to work? So as I get parts done and to my specifications, I'll release those. Uh, I'm going to put them out as STLs and as step files, so you'll have the ability to modify those and import them to whatever tool that you use. Um, I tend to use Fusion 360. I can share the project with you that way if you'd like, uh, but you know, you're welcome to use whatever you want. I'm going to post them out there as step files. Um, as far as kind of the cadence of this, I'm going to try to get out a, uh, a weekly or at least, you know, twice a week, maybe potentially, um, you know, part release. Uh, it, it takes time for me to be able to uh, post these things and, uh, you know, kind of manipulate the, the video and get it to a point where it's something that uh, I feel comfortable posting on the internet. Uh, in addition to that, it takes time to print. Um, so if it, if it goes, you know, a week or two, I'm sorry, sometimes I, you know, I have things going on and that's just what it is. Uh, this is not something I do for a living, it's just something that uh, I do as a, as a hobby. Um, so obviously work comes first for the time being. Um, as far as the, the status of the build, uh, I'd say it's about 90% done. I had to make a large change to the um, kind of the, the interlocking mechanism of the panels and the bases. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable with the status of the way they were. I found that when you you have kind of pegs sticking off of the top of another section, those are essentially weak points, right? So your strong points are going to be the uh, the layer lines um, in between the different layers that you print. So like if the if you have a striation of filament this way, that's going to be stronger than having two this way. So what I did was I redesigned it to use kind of an interlocking mechanism that um, I, very much like a Lego kind of snaps together, if you will. Um, I think it works a lot better. It's certainly a lot stronger. I've tried to break it at this point. It's been uh, pretty solid. So we're going to go with that. Um, feel free to change that. If you don't like it, that's up to you. Um, so I just recently got the base and uh, a couple of other pieces that I think are relatively close to ready to go uh, printed. And so today is going to be the release of the base. And that is, uh, it's a really simple piece. It didn't take a whole lot of time to print, but it was a significant portion of that because you have to have something that you can put everything else onto, right? So it's kind of the basis for the rest of the build. Um, the next part that I release will probably be a kind of a different version of that base that sits in between the different layers of the rack. So stay tuned for that. That's coming probably next. Um, so requirements for the project, the reason that um, this thing is built the way that it's built. So I wanted it to be very simple to print. I wanted it to be something that I could just throw on there and leave and go do whatever I needed to do for work or whatever I needed to do you know, in life. Uh, I wanted it to be something that I could just sit on the printer and go. Um, so you'll see a lot of the design that I did. It was, it's very obvious the way in which things were supposed to print. Um, to that end, I also wanted to minimize waste because, you know, wasted plastic is wasted money. There's no reason to build supports if you don't have to, right? So a lot of the, the design choices that I made 
uh, for instance, using um, you know chamfers rather than uh, you know a, a fillet, right? Uh, things like that, or you know having overhangs that are that are easy for a printer to build. That sort of stuff. It minimizes the amount of supports that you need. And if I recall, this print doesn't even need any supports on anything. So uh, you're welcome. Anyway, uh, as far as kind of the rest of the components for this, I wanted I wanted the rack to be uh, something that you could easily get parts for. So commercially available magnets, screws, that sort of thing, stuff that is you know very easy to source that you can just order directly from Amazon or off of the internet. And I'll put a list of parts out there that you'll need as we as we get to those. Um, as far as kind of the design of the enclosure, I wanted it to be modular. I wanted to, I wanted to have the ability to run things other than just Raspberry Pis. I wanted to be able to put a Jetson or I wanted to put, you know, an Odroid or, or something like that. I wanted the ability to do those things. Uh, so it's bigger than what I initially had intended. The initial design was relatively small. I think it was like 80 by 80 or something like that. It was kind of, a, it, was a, it was a box essentially. And what I ended up doing was close to, I think it was 130 by 200 millimeters. It's quite a large compartment. Uh, it even has the ability to kind of cable manage at the back. There's enough space in there for that. Um, so that was one of the things that I really wanted to do. I wanted the modularity of that. I want to be able to add uh, additional nodes. I want to be able to, um, you know, add up right so add more compartments add more blades that sort of thing so if i want to if i want to expand i can um but you know that also allows us to build enclosures that are you know two compartments instead of you know or use right uh, instead of you know five right so you can you can choose how you want to build it and i'll render the parts to be able to do from two all the way to five use so you'll have a two uh, a three a four and a five right um, that's, that's going to require some time because right now all I've got built is a 2 and a 5 because that's all I used. Uh, but it's, it's not too bad to do, it's just going to take me a little bit of time to do and print and test. Um, as far as the cable management, one of the things that I really wanted to build into this uh, is I hate seeing cables. I like, I like kind of a minimalist design, if you will. And I don't like seeing cables, I don't like seeing uh, you know, the sausage making, if you will. Uh, I, I want I want all that stuff hidden. Now that's not to say that I can't dive into it, and I do enjoy doing that. But I don't want to see it on my desk when I'm trying to get something done. You know, if I'm if I'm you know going to write an Ansible script today, um, or you know a playbook or a role or something like that, I don't want to you know spill my coffee tripping over some cables laying on my desk or something like that. So that's one of the design aspects I took into account in this. I wanted to make sure that it was all self-contained and that. It was essentially a box. You stick it on your desk, you plug it in, and go. Um, so that's really all I've got as far as, you know, kind of discussion for this video. Uh, the rest is going to be uh, an introduction to the rack, uh, an introduction to the part today, and then a time-lapse video. And then I may have something special for those of you with uh, Prusa LAC V2 enclosures uh, at the end. I'm not sure if I'm going to throw that in this video yet or not. It may be another one. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks for dropping by. I really appreciate it. I want to start by apologizing for how awful the audio is in this portion of the video. Um, yeah, I, I never expected to start a YouTube channel, and I don't necessarily have the highest end uh, audio and video equipment that, that's out there. So this is what I'm dealing with, and it's just kind of what you're going to have to put up with. Uh, anyway, so let's get started. So what you're looking at is the rack that is on my desk, essentially. This is an identical model. This is what I built. Now, you'll see over here, these portions are all out of date. Those are the ones I've been working on. So once those are ready to go, I'll update this entire model here, this assembly. Uh, but I wanted to give you kind of an overview of what you were looking at, uh, what, you, uh, what you saw. So let's open it up and see what's there. We'll start by opening the top. So up here, we've got a couple of things. So you got the Noctua fans. Those are going to be blowing out the top. Of course, heat rises, right? Now these buttons, these are to control the screens. So you'll have to take some buttons, solder them in, wire them into your Pi, write some scripts or something to control your, your displays. 
Um, so that one's going to control this. That one will control the OLEDs in the front of the other the other blades. Um, as far as kind of the hinge mechanism here, you've got a couple of screws in the back. You've got some magnets here in the front. There's a couple of magnets over here as well that kind of keep everything together. Minimize vibrations, that sort of stuff. Um, there's also another hinge here that gives you access to the bottom side of the fans for cleaning as well as to get to the wiring for those things and to get to that pie. It's kind of nice to be able to do that because the screen, when you got everything wired in, it's not particularly great to take out, um, but you don't really want to do that anyway. Um, as far as the rest of the, the top, I have another hinge here. We'll open this up. If my PC will actually work. Come on. Okay, cool. So, uh, you have a magnet here, magnet here, magnet here, and a magnet here. There's a hinge mechanism that we can drive into. Um, so those all just kind of sit on there. And those are easy to take off. You extend that out the entire way, lift up, the back door pops off. Same for these. Um, in here, I've actually rendered the components that I have sitting in my rack. So um, you're welcome to poke around in there and you can grab the same components that I did if you want or you know whatever else you want to get. Uh, let's go ahead and open up the front. You can see what that looks like. There we go. All right, so we'll open that up. And you can see, that's essentially what I've got running in the front. Now there's obviously some wiring and things like that. The fans here, those actually drive off of that pie. Anyway, let's go back to the rear open cam. Cool. Um, in the lower portions, we'll open this up. So down here, I've got a couple of pies, obviously. These are pie fours, um, so five of those. And those are all interconnected. You can see I have cable management on these trays. So that is, uh, that's kind of nice to have, uh, especially, you know, with network cars and stuff like that. Uh, of course, it is all hardwired. You wouldn't want to run Kubernetes over wireless. It'd just be kind of awful. Of course, there's magnets again, hinges. Uh, the bottom I actually have set up differently. The bottom, of course, you can throw a blade in there if you want, but that's not what I've got set up in there now. What I have in there now are kind of some storage trays for breadboards and SD cards and stuff like that. So you can see you know, what that looks like here from the back. And notice there is kind of a, a void in the back here. That's for cable management, right? So uh, you have these slots where you can throw wires in. I actually brought them all in the bottom in mine because I don't want it hanging out. But you know, if, if for some reason you wanted to pop one of those open, plug an SD card into your, or a USB into your Pi or something like that, you could totally do that and, you know, maybe that would be helpful for you. Maybe not. Either way, this component is just derived from one of those anyway. So they're all pretty much the same. I just cut some of it off. Um, as far as the Pies, I, I kind of want to show you a little bit about that because that was actually pretty complex and I, I really like the approach that I took to that and I bet you will as well. Oh, come on. Okay, cool. So when we look at one of these blades, let's look at the components on the front of the screen. Or on the front. Why did it do that? I really need to get solid works. Um Okay. Wow. All right. Um, let's ignore that. Anyway, so what you can see here, I've got a fan rendered in the front. Uh, that wires into the Pi. I, I actually usually run mine off of 3.3. You can run it off of 5 if you want. I like to keep the noise down. Uh, in the front here, you also have a Adafruit Pi OLED. Uh, I, I like those, they're nice and bright, however they do have burn-in, thus the button at the top of the, the tower. I wanted to make sure I had the ability to shut those off. Um, 
And I think the script that I'm going to write, which I haven't done it yet, I'm going to have it set up to where it only runs for like 30 seconds at a time anyway, and then you got to turn it back on, just because I don't want to burn those in. Uh, those will wire into um, the GPIO as well. Um, by the way, I apologize, my puppy over here is being annoying. Um, so yeah, all your all your cables coming in for, for instance, power here, they come up the side and then just plug right in. So uh, what I used, I, I believe, were just kind of uh, off the shelf um, USB C cables from Amazon. Um, they they work pretty well, so no no issues there. Um, let's see, we can pull out one again. Maybe this one will actually work. Maybe no. All right. Uh, one other one other interesting thing. So if you look at the front of this, you can see that actually snaps on and off. So you can change out the faceplates to uh, be whatever you want. If you don't want to run fans, that's fine. You can use these uh, vented slots like that. Uh, or you know if if you want to remove the Pio LED in the front, by all means go right ahead and do that. Uh, I'm not going to render those files for you, but it's really easy to do. Just grab a face and click delete, and it goes away. Um, so you know I use them for all of my blades simply because I like to have the statistical data. Um, but you know if you uh, if, if you don't, then you know that's up to you. Uh, as far as today's part, let's take a look at what we've got here. So. This is essentially the part that I've printed and the part that you'll see a link for in this video. Uh, it, it's, it's really not overly complex, uh, but it took a little bit of time to get right. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that I had neutral airflow through, or neutral pressure inside the chassis. I didn't want my fans to have to work hard. I didn't want to use extra power because of that. So I have, you know, vents coming in through the bottoms to where, you know, if if for some reason uh, enough air is not flowing in through the rest of the case, uh, you know it'll, it'll pull some more from here. Uh, I also uh, want to highlight the sections here that your kind of side panels are going to lock into. Right. Originally, the way this was designed, it was flat through here, and you had a peg sticking up from that. And what I found was the pegs would just snap off. Uh, again, you know your layer lines are going through here right they go this way and that's where your strengths at when you start stacking things that's when it breaks right so you know it, it's weaker going vertical than it is horizontal with 3d printing uh, so when you look at the side panels they print on the outside on the back and so your your layer lines your striations of your print uh, go horizontal so the strongest points of that print are also going to interact with the strongest points of this print. So it, it's really quite strong. Uh, and, and you barely even can tell that it's you know different than it was before. Uh, I, I think it's gonna work really well for this design uh, and I've tested it and it, it works great. So um, the finished part, uh, I'll, I'll pop up some pictures of that uh, as well as kind of give you a little bit of a, a video of what that looks like. I've got it sitting here beside me, but of course, you're on a screen, on a screen grab. So, uh, anyway, that's the part that you're going to get today, and then in a couple of days, hopefully, I'll have another piece that's going to be kind of like the midpoint uh, equivalent of this. And once you've got those two printed, we can start doing the side panels. But I don't want you to have to print the side panels and then not have anything to hook it up to. Uh, so let's start with this and uh, see how it goes. Um, anyway, that's what that's what I've got. All right, so some questions on Reddit came up about what slicer I use, what settings I use, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to explain that real quick. Uh, so first of all, I use Prusa Slicer. Uh, I have a multi-material unit. It just seems to work better uh, for my workflow and you know with the components that I have running. Uh, I, I pretty much run a, a Prusa shop, so uh, it just it just kind of fits better. Uh, it hides seams pretty well. It it just it works. Um, so let's talk about settings for a minute. So obviously with this particular component, we're going to print it on this side, right? Um, I find that rotating it uh, to kind of fit the print bed seems to work uh, a little bit better. So let's go ahead and rotate that. So let's see, for 90. Okay, so that puts it in the center. We'll go ahead and center it anyway. Uh, I generally don't need to adjust the infill on this. It's pretty strong anyway. Um, obviously this part doesn't need any supports. The only thing that might need supports is right here 
if you're using uh, you know pet G or something but with PLA it bridges that no problem um, we're gonna set it for Prusma PLA because that's I'm using Galaxy Silver uh, for this particular part uh, as far as print settings there is one thing that I change so I generally don't mess with scene position that sort of thing uh, but from the from the defaults the horizontal shells you have a top of five and a bottom of four well here's the problem with that so with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle you need 10 layers to kind of put this component together uh, this this wall here this shell that is two millimeters thick so if I weren't uh, if I if I didn't change that what I would have is four solid layers one layer of infill and then five solid layers I found that that adds about 10 minutes of time um, to the print simply because it's got to go slow over top of the infill as if it were trying to fill some void full of infill um, in addition to that it doesn't save a whole lot of plastic so it doesn't really make it worth it not to mention you know on the side panels it's going to be the same thickness if you have a bright led or something like that and it's shining through and you can actually see it you wouldn't want to see the infill i mean well maybe you do but i don't i, I would want it to be solid so i didn't see an infill texture you know kind of shining through um you know personal preferences i guess but for me uh i, I just set it for five and five and then i get a solid infill here and then of course uh, I'll have, you know, some gyroid at 15% around the outside, uh, but that is uh, essentially my my slicer settings. I don't really change a whole lot else. Um, let's go ahead and slice it and see what it's going to take. All right, so we're looking at 5 hours, 52 minutes. Uh, keep in mind, that's $2.78 worth of plastic for one part. Uh, this is a big print. Uh, if, if you don't have everything calibrated properly, if you don't know how things are going to fit, I would definitely recommend using some cheap throwaway plastic or something like that to test your tolerances, or even just kind of cut a chunk out here, and then when you get your side panel, uh, you know, step file, you know, maybe cut out a chunk of that and see how those fit, make sure they're tolerant. Um, you know, I, I, I have these calibrated to be essentially, you know, a uh, hundred microns uh, in here. So this is uh, 20, this is 15, and on the side panels, this is 19.9 and that's 14.9. So it's really, really tight. Um, yeah, and then of course the distance from here, that would be 10 in here and 9.9 .9 on the side panels. Uh, so like I said, play with your tolerances, Use some cheap plastic the first time. Um, make sure you get everything set up. I wouldn't. I wouldn't waste a bunch of really nice plastic, you know, the first time at least with some of these parts just to check and see how they fit. Um, but that's just me. Anyway, let's send it out for the printer. All right, let's get it going. All right. So from a prep perspective. Uh, I typically uh, won't start my printer until I'm absolutely ready for it. Uh, I don't like to get the uh, the black gunk buildup in the hot end and that sort of thing from leaving it on for a while. Not to mention it'll heat up this enclosure pretty good. Um, and, and you know, I don't want any blocked hot ends from heat creep or anything like that. Um, so I'll, I'll fire it up and just go pretty much for the most part. So this being a textured sheet, as you can tell, um, it does require a little bit more prep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some 99% isopropyl on there and I'll let that sit for a sec. Um, and so what that's going to do, that's going to remove any of the impurities and the, the PLA and things like that that may have been on there from the last print. Um, again, PLA on these sheets, I guess there are a couple of different batches of the Prusa textured sheet. This is one of the later ones and it, it doesn't quite stick as well as the older ones, but it creates kind of a, it's more of a satin finish. This is not a satin sheet, um, but it seems a lot closer to a satin sheet than the original textured beds would. Um, so let's go ahead and let that sit for a sec. And then as far as prep, that's about all I really need to do. Just make sure it's nice and clean. Um, now, I do have doors on my enclosure. And so I need to make sure that those stay open during this print because if I don't, it will build up temp and it will have heat creep. It happens. 
Um, sometimes these doors do close, so I tend to prop them open. As you can see right now, it's 24.3 in my enclosure. It generally will print about 30 to 31, and I'll get heat creep about 35. So if these doors close, it's definitely going to heat creep. Um, let's go ahead and get it fired up. And uh, you'll see a time lapse from this when it's done. All right, so this is the part that I'm releasing today. Um, this one came out all right. However, I did notice right on this edge right here and here, it looks like it has lifted off the print bed a little bit. So I don't think that's necessarily a design flaw. I think what it is is that just right there and there, it didn't stick to the Prusa uh, textured sheet. It looks like there might be a little bit there as well. So, you know, I'm using the newer Prusa sheets. Uh, they don't stick as well to PLA. So I'm probably going to switch over to something else for the rest of this build, simply because I'm not going to waste a bunch of plastic on this. Uh, if you have that option, you know, maybe you should do the same. Uh, so the one that I'm probably going to go to is this one here. So that's a, that's the king sheet. Um, and it reminds me a lot of one of the original Prusa sheets. Uh, so, you know, maybe give that a try. I, I'm not sure what to tell you there. Uh, but I'm certainly not happy with that result. Uh, that said, dimensionally, it's perfectly accurate aside from that. So that's what I was expecting. Uh, all of those meet the criteria that I need in order to release this part. Um, everything seems to be fine aside from the bed adhesion issues. So um, that's what I've got for you. Um, you know, I, like I said, I would recommend either going with a smooth sheet or go with one that's just a little bit um, tackier than the new Prusa textured sheets. Uh, the reason being, I think these, these sharp corners right here, they just don't stick nearly as well. So, good luck.